All right, uh, you can turn to Galatians chapter 5. Chapter 5, and we'll look at verse uh, 8, and then I will punctuate it with verse 9. And fascinating enough, he said, This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. And he said, A little leaven, leaveneth the whole lump. And wouldn't you like to have a gospel that wasn't contaminated with an admixture? In processing in the world of manufacturing and any product you're trying to make, you try to cull out things, and in your process, you might be uh, have to dross things off. It's called dross. You take the things that rise to the top in a melting process, for example. Then you put that in a barrel and you remove it. Well, leaven was, it's from the word zime, like the word, our word enzyme, where when it becomes in, stalled, it begins to cause catalysis and it can be very disruptive. But you notice he said a little leaven, a little bit of this. And in this text, we're talking about those who would modify the message. That is, they just added circumcision. Now, it wasn't pre-regeneration work they were adding. It was after people had already heard the gospel, trusted Jesus Christ for everlasting life, that these people came along and said, well, we appreciate all that and that wonderful news about Jesus and what he did, but it's time to get on with religion. Amen. It's time to get back to the flesh because our righteousness, which is according to the law, will not be accepted before God. Because when you hear people say, our righteous like filthy rags, what righteousness is that? Well, it's our performance measured in relationship to the law. Now, there's only the law. God's law has infinite implications. It can't be exhausted. We can't even enumerate it. We don't even know people who can cite it. So that we don't need to even begin to posture ourselves that somehow, maybe, there's some compliance standard to what degree. So as I would walk out there uh, in the world and ask my friends, I said, what law are you keeping? Because they always talk about keeping their standing, don't lose their standing, keep their salvation, don't lose their salvation. Now, do you understand what they taught is the only thing I just said. There's nothing that goes with it. I don't know if you remember, but there were billboards in the old days. They weren't that high up like the ones now. But you would see a billboard, but you knew that what was on the board wasn't behind it, right? It was just a face of the board. And now we know after coming out of these comical seasons where people don a mask of a clown. Y'all heard of that scary clown Pennywise? Boy, I was so proud of that. Uh, what came of that is children are afraid to go near storm drains. I know because of my four-year-old grandson, as we were walking down the sidewalk, there was one I said, oh, come over here and let's see a Pennywise down here. Whoa. He jumped back. You may not remember in the old days, a lot of our scary stories were to protect children. Did y'all know that? Isn't that great that my grandson at age four is already deterred from getting near something that could sweep him away? Now, I know it can happen because I watched a child play in one, and he went, up, he went down, and he came up on the other side of the road, but he was, um, had his pants, Levi's, had denim had hung up on a fence wire down below, and he couldn't come up, and I had to retrieve him. And I remember the first thing his mother said was how upset she was because he had tore his pants. Her mind couldn't process that her son had gone in a culvert and all the way across beneath a street. I wonder what would have happened had he learned to be afraid of things. You know how old will he have to become to actually fear what had happened to him? A lot of people don't value except through scars. And we were taught in the Genesis account that God intends for us to learn by education, not by experience. Amen? A dear student here, she was so beautiful. Now she's such a genius. I don't know if I can even talk about her without us spending the rest of the service. But she asked me once, Brother Carter, why did God place that tree in the garden? I said, so we could learn to live according to education and not experience. So if God taught us not to eat from that tree, that's all we needed was the information. And we needed to trust the one who taught us. So when we tell people a little leaven, leaven's a whole lump. If you don't know that the first consequence is Christ's death. And we talked about that, how people think, well, that's really not what we're talking about. It, it, we should just go ahead and go along with people who diminish what Christ accomplished. And even if it implicates Christ as having died in vain for no point, a useless, pointless death, let's just not churn the waters. Well, nobody is churning the waters except people who have no interest in the manifest righteousness of God. You remember when Christ was crucified, that that cross it was testified by him. It's finished and it remains finished. The consequences are permanent. And all that he accomplished. And it says that God, his Father, was in him reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins and trespasses against us. So what is it about religion that can't seem to endure much if it's about Jesus? 
Well, we just said it. So according to the Bible, the Father draws men. That's a description of how He persuades. And He does it through the prophets that He sent. And Jesus said in John chapter 6, those who listen to the prophets, that is, learn from them, will come to me. Jesus also taught in a lesson about a rich man and Lazarus. And He said when the rich man was posturing himself to say, I know what will help my brothers who are back at my father's house so that they won't come to a place like this. Send someone back from the dead. And in that lesson, Jesus taught us that if or since they are not listening to most in the prophets, then they would not be persuaded even if one rose from the dead. So God is true to his means of persuasion, which is the correct message, the gospel of Jesus Christ. People believed and trusted the gospel preached by the prophets, which spoke of the coming Messiah. And they trusted him and they had everlasting life. Today we preach the gospel. The Father sent the prophets. Jesus sent the apostles. We have the apostles' teachings. We have this gospel. And in this account, we have the value we should all have if our valuation is scripted accordingly of what type of gospel the Bible has to give us. Because when we talk about free grace, you know, that's a troubling phrase for some people. And it's in the Bible. Isn't it striking that they are averse to free grace? The word free, you remember uh, from uh, freo, which means exempt in the English when it first came into, our, into the English language? Exempt. But it's one term, charisma. Grace, an extension of grace. Charis is grace. Charisma is an extension of grace. So in what manner would God so love us that he would give us something that wasn't known to exempt us? What's it exempt from? Law. It's exempt from the law of sin and death, by the way. It's exempt from performance standards that would externally be imposed upon us who, by those who by pretense call something circumcision. They say it. And then... We're exasperated by it, and they can go about and make a show in the flesh. Now, one of the things they wanted to be proud of in this time and at this place was to try to reduce the friction between these ecclesias, now these Gentiles primarily, who are these churches out here, because they don't have an exemption from the Roman government as the Judaizers did. For example, the, an older, the older the religion, they would try to keep peace and not, uh, let's say, uh, deal with them. So that's why the Pharisee system was developed to assure the Roman government that we'll keep our people in check. Amen. So as long as the people were jumping over hurdles and going through hoops, then they were exhausted anyway. I mean, have you ever tried to deal with the psychopathology of religionists who sit back and just constantly prescribe things for other people? It's that in-group that doesn't apply it to themselves. They just simply exasperate others. It's the only thing they've got. You do understand, in this world... Unless you know the one who came into this world to seek and to save sinners, you don't know of another way. You're either the one jumping the hurdle or the one, thank God, you at least get to set them up and watch someone else do it. Amen. How pathetic and how dead it is. And then how exasperating is it when you see these people infuriated because we're free. We're free. So what we'll see now is something very interesting. Now, Paul had mentioned in 2 Timothy 1.12, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. First of all, the Bible by design only permits us to know the one in whom we believe. Did you notice that? Matter of fact, in creation, the very first word speaks of the Son of God, hand of violence, crucified. The very word, verb, create, is Son of God. You say, wait a minute, I thought we would have a lecture on the multivariate perspectives of the multiple creation theories of which I'm certain there's at least nine established that we can talk about. Well, great. And that's wonderful. If you ever find anybody interested, I have not yet to date found anyone on this planet interested in discussing creation. They're only interested in calling a position first and watching people exasperate themselves trying to react. Now, why would we react? I don't know. I, they can't seem to gain my attention. I think that bothers them as well. But when you can't find Christ in creation, then you don't know anything about creation because creation testifies of him. Uh, Jeremiah 10, 12 says that he stretched forth the heavens by his wisdom. That word's tavun. You say, what's that? I don't know that. I know. Who cares about the sound of that word? But the first letter is a cross. The second letter is a sun. The third letter is a nail. And the fourth letter is life. How could God in his infinite wisdom, which is that term, and in Psalm 147.5 says his understanding is infinite, his intelligence is infinite, characterize that expression by 
a simple picture gra pictograph that says a cross, a sun, a nail, and life. It seems that we might forget that if a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day, then it was just two days ago to the Father that His Son was on a cross. Why is that so difficult for us? Well, we think that when we came to know God through Christ Jesus, it became very personal, right? Because now He's our Lord. He's our Savior. He's our teacher. His wish is now our command. We serve Him because we are His, not to become His. Did you notice the difference? Yeah, see, religion says perform and hope someday you stand up. Now, they're not performing, it says. You remember Galatians 6, 12 and 13, Paul said, now these people that say circumcision are not practicing the law. Doesn't that just comfort you to know in that the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, would let us in on that which would otherwise never be disclosed? And have you remember people get so lathered up about something that you could ask them one of the most basic questions about the content of the topic and they not even know of what they speak? They wouldn't even recognize what they were causing so much stir about. Because when you don't invest your time and energy in studying something, it's because first, as the family that's here today, family over here in the seminary taught me, they don't really have any interest in it. It's so much more fun, you see, to play other people or be disappointed. You remember the people that we found that would just look for reasons to be disappointed in us? It reminded me of those parents that would destroy their children and then just be disappointed in them. But if you did a little background, a little root cause analysis, you'd find out that they had begun to find reasons to be disappointed in their children, even when their children were doing everything they could do. Have you ever noticed that the only thing religious people can do is find a reason to be disappointed? That's what they live for. It's their entire life. Paul says, I can know and still know permanently the consequence of whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded, and that consequence of having been persuaded is permanent. It's perfect tense. But I don't worry, who are you going to run into that even talks that way? We, we don't find people even want to know what the Bible says because they already know how to get along so well without it, amen? Because to live their life in a manner that would serve the interest of Christ, which is that His Father receive the glory, and that's by Christ in the ecclesia, and that we would watch and follow His teachings carefully because we want to have words of life. So we go on now. The most persuasive, gracious fact of all the Scripture here, Paul's finally had all he can take. You remember, he was the Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was of the tribe of Benjamin, the favorite son. When it came to the law, you couldn't bring a charge against him, especially if he was a good Pharisee. You could never seem to pin these people down. You know, we notice people, lawbreakers, fraudulent, deviants, but you just couldn't pin them down. And none of us could just stop our lives to go out and secure legal representation, and we sure couldn't appear in court as much years as that would take. But they were just thrilled at the fact that they could harm, hurt, and then not help. And then just step back and move on to the next place. Well, Paul was like that. He would, remember, he wanted to seek warrants for people's arrest because he didn't want to go out and persecute the way, the truth, and the life without it being legal. Amen? Because you don't want to hurt somebody unless you're doing it legally. Amen? And isn't that funny? Now, here he is, Paul, a small man. That's what the word means now, small man. And now he's had all he can take. And Galatians 2.16 says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Now let's word it out and listen to how painfully he says this. And specifically, to assure there's not any leaven at all. You remember when you prepare for the Lord's Supper, we purge out as a church the leaven that is hypocrisy. So that we don't, have any of the, and you won't find any of the antics and the hypocrisy and the uh, social dramas that are performed, choreographed, and people stay up late at night to work it out in churches that eat the Lord's Supper. It's foreign. It's, it's so far removed. And here are these new converts in these new churches in this southern region of Galatia, Gentiles who were never under the law. And at one account, we have in Romans where they were living better by their conscience than these religious people by their abuse of the law. So now they're trying to entangle these dear people. And here's the man that was the leader of the leaders who was the best of the best in destroying people, even going about to destroy people because they followed Jesus. How dare they follow the way, the truth, and the life? And he persecuted the way. Now he says, actually what he says, he says, as ones who have noticed, and few people notice, but he says, as ones who have noticed that no kind of man, notice this, no kind of man is being declared right 
out from any kind of works, of any kind of law. Now notice how he's just excessively wording this to where he doesn't leave room for any leaven, any addition and admixture of any kind of law. You remember when they debate in religion, Catholic, Protestant, Judaic, Islamic, Occult, New Age, Denominational one, Denominational two, or those intellectual constructs, Calvin versus Luther versus Arminus versus Molina versus Pelagius, which are just names of religious icons. They are trying to create a separate argument. The only thing in the Bible is law or grace. Do you hear that? And how are we justified? Faith alone. How do we stand right before God? And now this man, who was once the leader and perpetrator of crimes to the highest level, and authorized the stoning of Stephen, in which sermon Stephen was preaching, he said, you all have already turned back. They had already turned back to Egypt in their heart. You know, we noticed that. People would be here, but they weren't with us. They were just sitting there waiting on the opportunity to find some way to go out and socially maintain their social church membership at the expense of Christ church. You remember, if you have a social life, you might not even find interest in the eternal life. You understand? I have eternal life, and I really don't know how to even entertain people who want to offer me social life because it's such a game. It's lewd and base, low degree of difficulty. You don't even have to have a good IQ. And you can just pick one of the names of those religious leaders I just said or pick one of those theistic constructs, and you can just begin to tear people to the ground and tell people how disappointed you are. They don't agree with what everybody's established as fact. But now it's nowhere written. But let's hear what this man has to say. How would he purge out the leaven so that it would be so clear that no one could mistake it's by grace alone? What he just said, as ones who have noticed, we're always noticing. He used the perfect tense. It's also a causal. It's an adverb modifying the finite verb belief. Man, this is what causes people to trust into Jesus, he said. Because once we noticed and became a person who has noticed and is always noticing that no kind of man is being declared right, is being no kind of man, is that clear? No kind of man is being justified. Now from any kind of works of any kind of law, is it clear? Except through faithfulness of Jesus Christ. You notice that? Except through faithfulness of Jesus Christ. He said, when we notice that and are still noticing that, even we have believed into Jesus Christ in order that we might be declared right, just. Declared that way, not to be that way. It's not impartation, it's imputation. By the faithfulness, through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. Now, when you want to end a religious argument, just bring up the faithfulness of Jesus Christ and say, that's the standard. Perfect obedience, perfect fulfillment of all the law, perfect fulfillment of all righteousness, sinless, never born in bondage of sin, never able to sin, never willing to sin, and only here to do one thing, His Father's will. Oh, well, that's, that's standard, Brother Carter. There's just no, that's, okay. So why is it that only Jesus entered heaven, according to the Bible? Why were the eternal everlasting gates told to open only for one man? That's Christ Jesus. You say, wait a minute. If only Jesus went to heaven, what do we do? We enter Christ by faith. Amen. Isn't that glorious? That our interest is to enter Christ. So the Bible is very persuasive. Have you noticed that? This is the most persuasive expression of the gospel that's ever been written. Did you hear that? The most persuasive expression because it is the most exclusive, absolutely exclusive in its, well, it's absolutely, it facilitates exclusion absolutely of any admixture of any kind of law, any kind of work of any kind of law. So when you run into religious people who will run into you, and I don't blame people, I, man, I tell you right now, you may not have any marketable skills. Amen. What if people like the ones we knew they couldn't do any better but to compromise. And who better to compromise than Christ? After all, what did He ever do for us except, oh, that's right, lay down His life for us. Oh, what did He ever do for us? Oh, He came and fulfilled the law and then announced it to us that He's the way, He's the truth, He's the life. So you can see why this text is very problematic because when it's worded out for people as common as myself, there's no question anywhere, is there not? It says in John 3, 36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Remember, it says this persuasion, verse 8, chapter 5, it cometh not from him that called you. That's a different gospel. That's the persuasion was the different gospel, which is not another gospel. See, if the gospel has anything to say about anyone's faithfulness but that of Christ, which is exclusively 
His faithfulness, then it's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it doesn't do anything for those who trust it because those who trust it are not already having everlasting life. These people who already had trusted Christ and already have everlasting life are now being led away to say, hey, come over here and let's move on to something better. Remember, the word grace refers to God's exertion, the Father of Jesus Christ, His exertion of His holy influence. So this John 3.36, it says the one that believes on the Son is already having everlasting life. Now that's just very simple wording it, out, wording it out in grammar. You say, well, I know people don't agree with that. Well, maybe they don't read. Maybe they don't want to read the Bible. But there's no such thing as it not being expressly stated in the Bible after we read Galatians 2.16 and made it so self-evident that the, one, the tyrant of tyrants, persecutor of persecutors, the man who boasted of himself and his wonderful resume, the Pharisee of the Pharisees, of the tribe of Benjamin, the favored son. When it comes to the law, there were no charges. You couldn't make a charge against this man. He was Saul of Tarsus, the big man. Now God brought him down. Jesus confronted him and said, Why are you persecuting me, Saul? And he had us a good question. He said, Who are you, Lord? <laughs> it was a very good question. Very good question. And you remember it was very convicting to him when he watched Stephen die. It does bother those of us who have trusted Christ but then we were up to something much less than serving Him. So by the time Christ stopped Him on the road, all He needed to know was which Messiah it was. And He was persecuting the wrong. But it also says something interesting. He that believeth not the Son. That word there, believeth not, means negates persuasion. So in verse um, 8, chapter 5, Galatians, of this persuasion, John 3, 36, this idea of believeth not is someone who negates persuasion. Do you ever see people negate the persuasion of the gospel and you'd see them negate and void it and even prevent others from coming to Christ. Jesus lamented over Jerusalem. And if you ever read that carefully, you'll notice he said, oh, Jerusalem and that city of peace. Then he said, you stoned the prophets. But he said, how often I would have gathered your children. You remember he said to them, you all prevent those from entering the kingdom of God, the ones who were entering and he said to those who would prevent children from coming to him, literally at that moment he was speaking about biological children, but in the Lamentation he also spoke of children as students and those who were misled by the Pharisees. 1.1 million people died in that city because they walked along with these false religionists who were saying peace and safety, come inside these walls. And Jesus said, leave. But Jesus lamented and said, I would have gathered your children, but you didn't want it that way. You didn't want them to come to me because why would religious people want to interpose their message, interpose their take on something? Well, so that people would follow them and it would make a show in the flesh. And people say, oh, I, I want to hear what so-and-so's take is. Or, you know, Brother Carl, they might teach things a little different, but it's not a big deal. And yet the Bible says a little leavens the whole thing. Isn't it striking how people minimize the very thing that in its minimal presentation is the way it causes the most devastation. So it says here they're negating persuasion. 1 Peter 4, 17 says, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first began at us, that's got our attention, doesn't it? And what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Now that word obey there is, what about those who are negating persuasion by the gospel? It's the word correct message. What about these people who are negating persuasion by the correct message of the God? That's the Father of Jesus Christ. What, what will be their end, these people who are avoiding, negating this correct message of the God? They're negating persuasion by this correct message. How do they do it? Well, they modify it. And they change it. And it's just a little. But you remember what we learned in these churches here. All of a sudden they began to gnash and gnaw to the point that Paul said, be careful while you're doing this that you don't devour one another. You remember when people would add just a little bit of legalism here. You saw these factions and friction. and I kept thinking, well, but for their illiteracy, they weren't the worst people I'd ever met. But for their keen ability to modify the message and introduce law and try to commingle it with grace, they weren't the worst people, but they did do the worst things with their lives. Isn't that striking? That you would negate the persuasion by the gospel of Jesus Christ. As John 3.36 says, the one that is negating persuasion by the Son. Well, I've seen people try to interfere with me preaching the gospel. <laughs> I thought, Lord, help that person. 
And he did. He did. He helped them. We'll close here. John 6, 47. Jesus said, Very verily I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Isn't it striking that people try to look for a riddle today, a, a forensic, or in my profession we call it a technology, some type of methodology, and according to their forensic, they can then design some certainty. One man was saying, unless God selected you to go to heaven, you can't go. And then the next breath he said, but now you can't know if you're selected. It's unknowable. So anybody notice what he did? He added an unknowable condition to everlasting life. Oh, that's what he did? You mean you didn't notice that? Yeah, but Burke Carr, they really are passionate about that that they say so adamantly, they affirm so adamantly, but then they have to concede because of their construct. You can't say you know, because remember religion says you may not say you're already having everlasting life, and that's the very thing Jesus told us. <laughs> I think it's wonderful. You either believe what Jesus said, or you believe what they say that Jesus never said. We either are persuaded by the gospel, the correct message of the God, the Father of Jesus Christ, who said, this is my beloved son, be listening to him. And we either believe that Jesus was telling us the truth when he said, they are not listening to most in the prophets, for they spoke of me. But the ones who did listen, that is, learn, came to me. Isn't that interesting that Galatians 2.16, we have a man who was all about admixing the works, all about the hypocrisy, all about manipulation, even persecuting to the point of death these people who served Jesus. And now he, in one passage of Scripture, has 100% absolutely removed any possibility of any admixture or commingling of any kind of law with any kind of works of any kind of law. You say, he really say it like that? Well, if you want to read the common, highly inflected, wordy, easy and self-evident language called Koine Greek, yes, that's exactly what he said. Exactly what he said. Let's pray. Father, we come to you now so grateful for this day especially for the gift of free grace. We're especially thankful that that grace is exempt from any admixture of law, any admixture of works of any kind of law, so that we might truly know the truth, the absolute truth, that no man is being justified, declared right, out from any kind of works of any kind of law, except through the faithfulness of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we're so thankful for your faithfulness to love your Son, to receive glory only by your Son, and that your Son alone was the one you elected, chose, According to your scriptures in Isaiah 42, he's the elect one. He's the only one that you commanded us to be listening to. He's the only one that we are to mind in association with. That is his message, his words, his ways, his walk. Father, we thank you that there is no admixture, there is no confusion except that which is interposed onto the scriptures. We thank you that your gospel is absolutely pure from any admixture of any exertion, work, law, any compliance with any kind of law. And Father, for this good news, this great gift, we thank you and we praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand now for